Good evening. Thank you so much to everyone who is joining us for this webinar. My name is Amara Enya, and I'm the Managing Director of Diaspora Rising. Uh, we are a transnational organization that works on behalf of the global Black diaspora. Our goals are to advocate, educate, amplify, and connect the global Black diaspora. And to that end, we work around the world on the most pressing issues that we face with the goal of developing strategies that are collaborative, of amplifying the messaging and the messages that are coming from people of African descent around the world and building the kind of world that is just and reflects the values that we hold. So we're very excited to bring to you this, this dialogue this evening on the heels of a very pressing issue that did not just materialize in the last couple of weeks, although it has gained national attention in the last couple of weeks, it's actually a longstanding issue uh, that is the outgrowth of US foreign and domestic policy and immigration policy. So a couple of weeks ago, people were able to witness, unfortunately, um, what was happening at the southern border in Del Rio, Texas, with Haitian and other Black migrants who, to in the numbers of almost 15,000 or around 15,000, were camped out under a bridge in Del Rio. Um, the images that came out from that were shocking, were dismaying, um, and really recalled some of the darkest parts of the history of this country and a few others. And so some of those images really sparked uh, a firestorm of, of responses, of reactions, of calls to action. But it also sh shone light on what has been a longstanding issue as it relates to US foreign policy, specifically when it comes to Black uh, migrants, Black asylum seekers, Black refugees, and how they are treated. And so we wanted to make sure, one, that we were checking in with our Haitian family, with those who have really been at the front lines of doing this work, that have been advocating on these issues long before a couple of weeks ago. And we wanted to provide context because we think that it is important not just to analyze issues in the moment and going along with just what we see in the headlines, but to really understand the roots of these issues so that we can have a better understanding of the solutions and what we need to do to address these issues uh, in a way that reflects what we demand. So to that end, this dialogue uh, came together and it really was spurred by a documentary that our, one of our panelists was a part of, and I'll let him describe it, but it could have been done two weeks ago and it was actually done quite a few years ago. And so this was a moment that it felt so relevant and we wanted to share that uh, documentary with you all and then engage in uh, a dialogue about the documentary and about these issues, both in the present day, but also the historical context. So it's really an honor to uh, present to you our three esteemed panelists that are here with us that'll engage in a conversation after we watch the film screening. But we have with us Jimmy Jean-Louis, who is in the film that you will see. He is a Haitian, he is the Haiti ambassador at large. He is an activist, he is an actor. Uh, he has been uh, very prominent on that scene uh, and has been doing work on behalf of Haiti and Haitians for such a long time. And so we're very honored to have him uh, talking about this film. We're also joined by Christina Francois. She is a part of the Black Collective. She has been working in social justice. She's been the executive director of the Office of New Americans, uh, where she's located in South Florida. And I'm excited to have her introduce herself and some of the work that she's been doing on the front lines of these issues. And finally, last but not least, we have Professor William Balan Gobert, who is a Haitian activist, a scholar, an author uh, based at the University of Chicago, who has been uh, writing and speaking on Haitian history for a very long time. And so it's an honor to have them joining us for this discussion. And they'll talk more about their backgrounds in, in the work after we watch the, the short film. But I wanna turn it over to Jimmy to just introduce this documentary for us and to get us started. Uh, hi, uh, um, it's always 
honor to be and also to be with uh, everybody else on this panel. And uh, you know, the, the documentary came about maybe four to five years ago when, the, when we learned that there was a group of Haitians stuck at the, at the border in Tijuana between Mexico and America. And with my good friend, Rain Wilson, the actor that most people know from the office, we went down there with the camera to try to understand what was going on. And uh, when we got there, I mean, personally, I was amazed to see the, my, 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 my brothers and sisters being in, in such a bad uh, situation, living in shadow, completely inhumane. So, you know, we did a documentary and uh, I took that documentary around a little bit, went to Haiti with it, went to Washington, showed it to some pretty prominent people at the time, uh, hoping that something would be done. But uh, unfortunately, four years later, we saw the images of, uh, of El Rio Grande. So this is what the documentary is about, is about the fact that those people have been in a bad situation for, for a lot longer than people think. Some people were able to, to explain about what they went through uh, throughout the journey, meaning by that having to walk a lot through the jungle, you know, catching the bus, crossing rivers, you know, dangerous rivers. Some of them had crocodiles. Some of them died while crossing. Some of them uh, had to leave their friends behind because they were hungry and there is nothing they could do. Uh, and you could see the, the, the suffering in their, in their eyes, you know, as they were telling their own stories, you know, and, uh, most of them, we have to understand that most of those people actually had to borrow a lot of money from Haiti. So not only they went to Brazil, Chile, and then hoping to walk all the way up to America to be stuck at, in Tijuana. At that particular time, their family is full of because the family had to borrow money wherever they could so they could pay for that journey. And those people were stuck and just didn't know what to do. And it's, it was quite... You know, I mean, I, th I think most of the time, you know, we were just weeping, you know, with, uh, uh, with some of the people from the crew because because uh, we just couldn't believe what we were witnessing and, and the, the stories that they were telling us. And all that is because, of course, as we know, because of the situation in the country, because of the situation in Haiti, uh, that they were pushed to do what they were doing. And, um, and also because there was the first wave of people who could actually get access to America. And then all that stopped quite uh, abruptly. So, uh, you know, miscommunication, those people went to the journey and they got stuck and there's nothing we could do. So, yeah, I mean, many stories like that. And also we interviewed the past, uh, welcome them, people working uh, with immigration, uh, all kind of people to try to tell the right story. Ken, I would love to bring Professor Balan Gobert in just to provide a little bit of historical context. As Jimmy is talking about uh, people making this journey through Brazil, through Chile, uh, paying a lot of money. I know uh, in a report that I read in 2018 that it said that this, the industry for migrants is $6.6 .6 billion. It's a $6.6 .6 billion industry. So folks really have to pull money together to make that journey. Um, Professor Balango Bear, can you talk a little bit more about the historical context of uh, what is creating the, the conditions for uh, the migration? Thank you very much for the question. <clears throat> I don't know if I'm, I will be able to, in a brief moment, to talk about it, but I'll give you a brief idea. The, what we see, of course, is a result of globalization and also of liberal, neoliberal policies that were imposed in Haiti on Haiti rather, uh, during the administration of, uh, for most of Haiti's uh, history, in fact, but uh, particularly with the, the Reagan administration, the Bush administration, 
the uh, Clinton administration and also, of course, you know, the uh, Obama and so on. What it began as a, and also, of course, the link between the, the, the Duvalier regime, the regime of the Duvaliers and the United States during the Cold War, they wanted allies. And so what they wanted to do is to create a situation where they, uh, they have cheap labor uh, uh, and, and a lot of Haitians who were, Haiti's predominantly in agricultural society. It was based upon agriculture. And so by, by imposing neoliberal policies, they created what they call in Haiti, park industrial, industrial parks, where a number of a rural uh, used to be peasants become proletarians, become workers in the cities which created a massive influx, what in Haiti we call l'exode rural, a rural exodus from the countryside into the city, into the main city. And so there is a neglect of agricultural production. So Haiti did not produce as much to enter into the market visibly. So it became a, a country not only dependent upon uh, uh, other kind of economic uh, structures like uh, assembly plants or sweatshops, and so on and so forth. But once the people come to the capital that became that created what is called the slumization, if that word exists, I'm <laughs> sorry for creating a word, of the capital city of Port Prince. Port Prince became uh, uh, unbelievably overpopulated. But I must say, in all fairness, even before the neoliberal policies were imposed on Haiti, and then also, of course, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Clinton administration in particular, later on, imposed. Uh, a structure whereby Haitians did not produce any rice anymore and a number of other factors. So you, you get people then begin to look elsewhere for work. But before that, what I was saying earlier, to be fair, way before that, Haitians have always gone abroad because of migration of workers, uh, the, the massive migration of workers. Haitians have gone to Dominican Republic, Haitians have gone to Cuba and elsewhere to find work. But still, this is the result of uh, policies that were imposed upon the country, economic policies that made Haiti not only dependent on, on the world economy, but also dependent upon the kind of uh, industrialized uh, structure that they imposed on the country. Okay, so having said all that, but there is also a massive propaganda that the United States have played, have pro uh, pro pro projected, that is to say that the myth of a, a democratic heaven that uh, as inscribed in the Statue of Liberty, let, let the, you know, everybody will be welcome. So people buy into this to a good extent. So there are many factors that, that, that are linked together. So to, to make, to not to be, to belabor the point or to be too long in my, in my attempt to address the very in interesting question that you asked that I cannot really do justice to right now, is that it first began within Haiti. There is a massive exodus from the rural area to the capital and from the capital to elsewhere. And elsewhere then of course becomes the United States, Canada and everywhere else that Haitians can find a better life. Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, with what I was seeing uh, with, uh, with the wonderful documentary that, that Jimmy made possible, what it shows it at once, although you didn't ask me that question yet, but it at once uh, dispels the myth about the immigrant who's coming for a handout. These people are unbelievably entrepreneurial. These are individuals who come with a lot of gifts, a lot of determination, and, they, they, and, and studies show and, uh, conclusively that these individuals, these people, contribute greatly to the American economy, contribute greatly to American culture, contribute greatly to uh, American citizenship. And studies have shown also to dispel another myth that the criminality among Haitians is exceedingly low by comparison. So it's not true that these individuals are going to come here as criminals or as individuals who are going to be a burden upon the state. Uh, a number of myths like that have been dispelled and continue to be dis dispelled. The adverse effect of that, uh, excuse me for going so long, is that there is what is called a brain drain in Haiti. So as a result of the uh, massive migration of individuals uh, because of globalization and also elsewhere provides a uh, better haven, so to speak, for intellectuals and other people in the professional class, they find themselves going elsewhere. There are more Haitian doctors in Canada uh, than in Haiti or in the United States and professors and researchers and so on and so forth are outside. So the brain drains the problem. But the, 
good side of it is that remittances then becomes much more prevalent. So for example, a lot of Haitians send money at home to help with the people. Now, I don't know whether or not that's a good thing economically because the people become dependent upon others who send their money inside. But the short of it is this, we cannot understand the plight of the Haitian people without understanding the role that the United States and France and Canada and other countries have played in Haiti to create the condition that led Haitians to, to live in Omas. But this is to say that Haiti cannot provide to its children, to its, to its citizens, that which the United States promised to provide to them, precisely because Haiti has been stopped. Haiti, Haiti's economy, politics, and so on have been controlled from outside, that created a condition that leads to the exodus. I mean, roughly speaking, that what I would say, but that was very quick and perhaps uh, uh, too, uh, too reductionist. But, but I, I, as a whole, I think that is what we have to understand. Well, I mean, I think that's an excellent uh, opening, just taking a look at the historical backdrop of what's happening, what we're seeing presently. And definitely after we view the film, we want to kind of do a deeper dive into some of that historical context, particularly the role that the U.S. has played, that France has played, that Canada has played. I wanted to, before we view uh, the, the film, turn to Christina Francois. You've been working uh, with the Haitian community, with other Black migrants for a while now. And can you just talk a little bit about what you're seeing now with the work that you're doing up close? What are you seeing now with uh, Haitian migrants, asylum seekers, and how has your work changed over the years? Thank you so much. I would say that we've we've been witnessing a, t a shift in our migration flow over the last 20 years, which dates back to um, the second ouster of Alistair and the Munistaf, um UN peacekeeping mission, uh, which the initial wave of um, peacekeeping, um, I call them soldiers, but you can, I mean, they're do their thing, um, was overwhelmingly coming from Chile and Brazil. So actually you see this, this intentional relationship between these three countries dating back to 2005. And so when it comes time um, to have a humanitarian response by the global community in 2010, um, you see an active recruitment of laborers, as was mentioned by the professor, um, to, to come to Chilean and Brazil and, and other countries in South America um, with work authorization. So I think that people really need to understand that this is a different pattern. Previously, we had seen this migration to Cuba and to Puerto Rico and to Dominican Republic and staying in the Caribbean basin. And then later on in times of crisis, seeing a migration by plane and by sea to South Florida and the Eastern shoreline here, because um, folks are now further away from home, right? They're, they're in the, the Southern cone of South America, um, living in in very hard well we'll we'll talk about we'll see what happens in the film um but really seeing this we we here in south florida um and folks who are immigration practitioners like myself had been seeing increasing number of clients coming seeking asylum from brazil and chile because of the living conditions that they were living in so um we have to add the layer of it. it's not just a u.s uh u.s imperialist um issue, it's actually a hemispheric issue. And so we're seeing that countries across the region are um, not as welcoming um, and, and increasingly exploitative of, of the Haitian um, diaspora in the region. That's such a good point. I'm so glad you made that point because I know that a lot of the attention, of course, has been on the US because that was sort of what was in the headlines, but we cannot forget uh, the role of the other countries that are along the, that route, so Brazil, Chile, and the conditions that actually they had to leave those places to continue en route to the U.S. So that is really uh, such a critical point that I'm, I'm so glad that you made uh, in this conversation. I want to turn now to text so we can uh, view the documentary, and then we'll be able to continue the discussion uh, afterwards. So over to, to tech. Hello, so Pancake, may I help you? Gotta go. Great, my man. Jimmy Jean-Louis. Come on, Oye. I'm fun, man. Like passé. I'm fun. So what's going on? You know, just putting a little work in here at Soul Pancake. Cool. 
brings you here? I'm hungry, really. Want to grab some food? Yeah, I'm starving. What are you thinking? Haitian. You got a place in mind? Yep. Let's do it. Yeah, man. Let's call an Uber. So where's this place anyway? Tijuana, baby. We're going to get Haitian food in Tijuana. Can you, uh, can you explain that to me? Two things. First of all, there is no Haitian restaurants in LA. Why is there a Haitian restaurant in Tijuana? Because Tijuana is full of Haitians. There are Haitians in Tijuana? Yeah. A couple dozen, a couple hundred? There's a full community there, thousands. Okay, I'm a Haitian dude. How do I get to Tijuana, Mexico? After the earthquake, they left Haiti. Some of them were able to go to Brazil, Chile, South America. They couldn't find jobs, decided to come north to America. Got stuck in Tijuana. Thanks so much. This is the place? Yep. This is the place, my friend. Look, Haitian flag. <laughs> you see? Hola, senora. Dos comidas uh, Haitian, uh, por favor. Uh, rain, rain, rain. Okay. Well, let me handle that. Okay. Okay. So I'd love to hear their stories. Can you ask them mm. how they got to Tijuana? What kind of work were you doing? If you guys were working from job to job, why did you leave? Put it on the party or something and drive it. Because sometimes they abuse them, sometimes they don't pay them. Oui. Let, let, let me translate that because I think that, that's very interesting. The brother with the dread, you know, he's he's saying that Mexico is doing a lot for the Haitians. Uh, it's up to us, to the Haitians, to be legal and then stay in the society and become part of it. Etats-Unis, Donald Trump pas tapé dans mouté pour ta venir en contrat de déportation. Nous tout net tapé en entendre. All of these people are feeling the pressure of supporting their families back at home Every in Haiti. Every single Haitian outside of Haiti feels the pressure of supporting their families. Wow. What situation économique pays en pas bon et bien on pas gain le choix, pas gain l'autre bagaille qu'on ca fait décider sortir pour en qui mesure capable établir un côté pour capable vivre au moins tant qu'au monde. 1er avril, ça fait 4 ans de nous quitter Haïti. Nous passons 10 pays pour nous arriver là. 10 pays. Qui me fait un pile parcours pour nous arriver là au Mexique. Nous passons Pérou, nous passons Équateur. Nous ne prenons pas avion, machine à pied. On va dire nous on monter bis on monter la mer te gien pile la boue moi te malade pendant me t'enrager et me passer euh 8 pays bon ici a fait 9 États-Unis qui t'a fait 10 bon pas gien chance ko rivé Nicaragua Guatemala nous fait 4 jours marcher à pied sans manger on fait quatre jours en bus pour arriver à Tijuana. Mi nombre es Sandra Albiquer y ahorita colaboro en el Colegio de la Frontera Norte. Estamos haciendo un estudio sociodemográfico para conocer la situación de la población haitiana que está aquí en Tijuana. Bueno, de acuerdo con el Instituto Nacional de Migración, 
Por Baja California han cruzado alrededor de 20.000 haitianos. Alrededor de eh, 15.000 lograron cruzar a Estados Unidos. Háganse para acá. Hey, welcome my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Quizá. Uh, what was this about? Okay, bye, Woblin. Man, there's a play going on on Sunday. I think they want us. To act? Yeah. Seriously. Are you up for it? Let's do it. All right. I could get discovered. <laughs> <laughs> Et si les policiers des États-Unis ont pris, qui s'est fait Ils ont mis la prison, ils ont fait plus que... 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 Ouh, Trump piñatas En realidad, todas las personas que cruzaron de Haití a Estados Unidos fueron durante la administración de Obama. Quienes cruzaron en la siguiente administración fueron todos deportados. Entonces, definitivamente cambió la lógica migratoria de un día para otro. De tal manera que solamente aquí en Tijuana, en los últimos meses de 2016, llegamos a tener hasta 3,500 personas. Eso rebasó las capacidades de atención de los albergues que, y tuvimos que habilitar 31 albergues. Porque ellos llegaron en un momento de mucha necesidad. Porque ellos no tenían nada y estaban durmiendo todas las familias en la calle. No había quien les tendía la mano. Moi, hace, me sentí Brasil, más de tres meses. Todo el mundo me fez, dominó la rue, me hablaba muy bien, me decía sin parar. Me fez tapar chula, la inmigración me dijo nueve meses, me dijo para qué me, me dijo que me liberé, me vine a ver, no me ha dicho, es ya cuatro. Another side of Tijuana, I tell you. Yeah, that looks a lot like Haiti, right? It does. How'd the Haitians end up out here? There's a pastor here that welcomed them. So he has a church, and that's what we're gonna see. We're gonna try to visit them and see how many Haitians come here. This smells bad. It's terrible. Fui muy misionero durante muchos años, y nunca quise ser pastor. Okay, sound? And we're rolling? I built with my hands. I have a dream. In that dream, God said me, you have to build a very big church. You have to build fast, very fast. Many, many people came here and helped me. Hallelujah. How many Haitians were staying here? Science. August to this point, we have about 3,500. And how many are living in the church now? About 200 in this moment. How do you get help to help the Haitians? I work, my wife work in all the donations that the people provide us. Not the government, <laughs> the government. Que la, la organización por estar en la frontera, el enfoque real es los deportados. Realmente aquí en todos los albergues de la ciudad fue un desbordamiento total porque llegaron en cantidades muy grandes a buscar un alojamiento en los albergues. Se hicieron la, las iglesias cristianas, tenemos habilitadas. Mira, este es el lugar que nosotros habilitamos con unas casas de acampar. Ces informations sont floues parce que d'après ça, on peut là qu'il y a plusieurs monde. Mais c'est qu'on pense, il y a l'autre monde qui a l'autre pensé, donc pas qu'il y a monde qui a même pensé, alors que nous tous supposons qu'il y a même pensé. Et nous n'avons pas fait papier, soit on a le fait main. Oui. Nous même, nous n'avons pas le fait main pour ne pas déporter, non Oui. Nous sommes là. Oui. Nous sommes là. Oui. Nous sommes obligés à le porter tête nous aller, pour ne pas déporter, non Pero el problema es que los haitianos en realidad no quieren ser reconocidos como refugiados en México, porque eso les quitaría la posibilidad de ser reconocidos como refugiados en Estados Unidos. So now, when they go to the border, they're not going to have that white paper to show. So that means they live in Mexico. 
so they don't have that paper that gives them that. Uh, so that's a catch-22. It's a catch-22. Tijuana is one of the cities most violent in the country at moment, although it doesn't feel it, but it's one of the cities most violent. And if there's a good zone, a lot of drugs, you see a lot of people. Ellos no quieren ser deportados porque en Haití hay muchas enfermedades. Hay enfermedades que en el resto de Latinoamérica, que también es muy pobre, ya no existen. Para mí mismo, personalmente, yo soy un hombre marido. Yo soy un capitán. Yo soy un hombre aquí en Haití. Yo soy un hombre que me ha dado la vida con mi madre. Y finalmente, mi madre me ha dado la vida de pasar la vida. Il doit se passer parce qu'il y a des gens Mais moi-même, je n'ai pas de chance pour m'aller. Pour moi-même, je me sens nécessaire. Certaines fois, nous avons quitté Haïti, nous pensons que la situation est la plus bonne. Mais sincèrement, la situation n'est pas du tout plus bonne parce que côté nous trouvons nous là, il est très, très, très difficile. C'est petit moi, quand vous demandez pour me faire ça, non, c'est Chris Lane, Esther Faustin. Él es uno de los bebés que más hemos querido. Y fíjense bien, este es un caso. El niño está en Miami. El papá decidió quedarse aquí con nosotros. ¿Por qué quería quedarse? Porque no puede ir a Estados Unidos. Él sabe que no va a cruzar. Sí. Quizás nunca. Tú te tienes que, tienes que vestirte. Here we go. Places, please. Places for the passion play. You can be a soldier. Yeah, or you can be a the devil. What? No. <laughs> I'm a gladiator. I'm helping uh, torture Jesus. Okay, you're going to be uh, Joseph. Of Joseph. Arimatea. What are we doing? What are you doing? What are we doing? No idea. Después de diez países que cruzaron, fue la única iglesia que les abrió las puertas. Eh, que nosotros eh, tenemos vida, vida eterna. Lo que yo deseo para ellos es que ellos triunfen, estén bien en esta nación. Estoy buscando hacerlos emprendedores de negocios en este país. Si no voy a ir a Estados Unidos, ¿qué plan voy a tener? ¿Qué plan voy a tener? ¿Qué plan voy a tener? Así que esa es la frontera. Aquí estamos en México. Y puedes tirar un frisbee y tener que caer en los Estados Unidos. Mucho de hullabaloo sobre estas paredes. Se ve realmente que hay mucha mucha voluntad por parte de mi organización, en el caso de que yo la lidereo y que estoy. Las fronteras lo único que hacen, dividen, separan, marginan. Ellas las ha inventado el hombre. Y lo único que han provocado es muerte, separación de familias. No obligen a Britain, si no con esto tú llegues, amén. Las personas de Haití, como cualquier persona del mundo, no puede ser definida por la nación de donde viene, el tipo de migrante que es, la forma en la que cruza, sin documentos o con documentos, sino por la calidad de persona que cada uno demuestre ser. Jimmy, you didn't really bring me down here for lunch, did you? Best chicken I ever had. Mais ou même, qui soit pensé, est-ce que nous ca bon Dieu ca ouvrir un porte pour nous? Pour nous avancer pour plus devant, est-ce que 
bagaille ka plus ou moins pour nous Thank you so much for for that powerful powerful documentary. Um, there are a couple of things that that stick out and just thinking about some of the narratives that uh, Jimmy that you had a chance to engage right there with individuals who've made that journey. Um, and I'm reminded of organizations like Haitian Bridge Alliance and we'll drop a link in the chat who do direct service work uh, with Haitian migrants, with asylum seekers. They are in Texas, have been in Texas, they've been in California doing that frontline work. And so we want to make sure that they have the resources that they need, the financial resources that they need to continue uh, to work with people directly. Um, but a, a couple of things stand out uh, from this film that I wanted to touch on as we continue our discussion. Uh, and Jimmy, it's it's a phrase that uh, was was, stated at the end about borders and that they separate, that they marginalize, uh, that they create death, uh, just these notions of what the border has meant to so many people. Can you talk about the most impactful moments that you took away from your time uh, in Tijuana and, and talking to uh, Haitians that were, that were a part of this, this film? Uh, I should say that the most impactful moment is, is a positive one. Uh, what I realized is that after just a few months being in Tijuana, they had already established their own business. They had restaurants, they had things going on within the struggle that they were going through. So it was quite incredible to witness that. But at the same time, uh, when, when we talk about borders, when we talk about human flow, when we talk about immigration, you know, I, I, think, I think humankind had the tendency to forget history, to forget how borders were created and by whom. We forget who, have, who were the first immigrants in this very same land, which is America. You know, we forget about who were the first people from this land, where are they? You know, what do they mean to this country these days? So I think, you know, when we deal with immigration and borders, we have to take in context history of immigration, and then maybe we'll have a little bit of sympathy for the people that are going through it at this present time, because the human flow is just a normal thing. It's always been around. People have always migrated from one country to another one, from one continent to another one. And those people that we saw, that I, that, that I met in, in Tijuana are people that are trying to look for a better life. You know, they, they left Haiti, yes, but they went through 10 different countries in a search of a better life. They are not bad people. They're not criminals. They're just looking for better opportunities. And what pained me at the end of this very documentary is when that lady said, we hope God will open a door for us. But that door, we saw it two weeks ago. Unfortunately, that's the door that was open to a lot of them. It was at the Rio Grande. So it's, it's yeah, it's, it, you know, once again, uh, being Haitian, you know, you don't want to see those kind of images. And, and being in America, you don't want to see America projecting that kind of image as well to, to the rest of the world. So. So we, we as, uh, as, as, as people, we just have to make a greater and better effort to really try to understand each other and to have a bit more sympathy for each other and, uh, and, and to respect each other as well. And, uh, and, and, and the last point I'd like to add is, you know, Haiti has always done great things for the world and specifically for America. You know, let's not forget that without the revolution in Haiti, there wouldn't be the purchase of Louisiana. Louisiana, the third of, of America, right, was about seven states back. Think just based on that single fact, there should be a different kind of relationship between USA and Haiti, and definitely a different kind of treatment towards the Haitians. You bring up a couple of just really powerful points. Um, first being the, 
the enterprising nature of, of the people to even in the process of moving from one country to another country to another country, they're setting up restaurants, they're figuring out, they're setting up businesses, they're making it work in a way that is so industrial, industrious and so enterprising. Uh, and then this other point that you bring up that I, I, I want to to pass it over to Professor Balango Bear to talk about the relationship that the U.S. has with Haiti uh, and, and this notion that there would be no U.S. without Haiti and, and some of that history. So, Professor, can you expound a bit more on some of the, those historic points that Jimmy uh, alluded to? Uh, well, I think Jimmy did a, an excellent job giving an overview of the situation. I don't know if I can replicate it, but yes, I can only underline some of the things that he mentioned. Uh, the relationship between Haiti and the United States is, is, is a long one, even before the revolution, in a sense. But at, at that time, Haiti was called Saint-Domingue. Uh, the, the relationship between Jefferson and after, of course, with the revolution and with Toussaint Louverture, in fact, there was a a clause that was created in the United States called the Toussaint's Clause as a result of what has happened uh, when Toussaint Louverture became the governor general of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the entire island of Hispaniola, which encompasses uh, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. But also with the Declaration of Independence 1803, and the, I mean, the, the, it was independent 1803, but the Declaration was 1804, there were, of course, links. But even let's go a little bit before that, which is what um, uh, uh, Jimmy uh, correctly alluded to earlier, is that during the uh, the, the war uh, uh, of independence, uh, Napoleon wanted to reestablish uh, uh, to establish a, a an empire in the Western Hemisphere, and Saint Domingue, which was of course the richest colony that France had at that time, which was Haiti, was going to be the headquarter of that of that of that um, not Louisiana and not Canada, by the way, incidentally enough, because that was French territory. Also, even where we are right now, Illinois was considered to be French territory, all the way to St. Louis, which is why it was Saint Louis, Saint Louis, which was the after the uh, uh, Saint Louis. Of course, you know the story better than I do. So anyway, with the with the with the demise of the French, the the, the, the dream of establishing a French empire in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, in the, uh, uh, which Haiti would, would, would have been the headquarter of that. Uh, Napoleon then sold the Louisiana Purchase Territory, not today's Louisiana. Today's Louisiana is nothing as compared to the territory we're talking about. We're talking about it, it, it almost doubled the size of the colonies, the 13 colonies that were before, because people forget that the United States existed as only a few colonies in the Eastern uh, border. And then you know, and the Spaniards were all the way in, you know, um, uh, Florida and other places in, in, in California and so on. But anyway, the entire middle of the United States was made possible as a result of what had happened in Haiti. Uh, but even before that, uh, there were uh, 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 saint domingue uh, later on Haitians, Africans, who were recruited by Lafayette to fight in the, uh, in the War of Independence. So there too, you find that Haitians or Haitians to be, of course, it are kind of anachronistic now to say Haitians, but there were Africans who were recruited to fight in a war to liberate the United States from other in, in, the, in the fight among the empires, the Spain, of, of France, uh, England, and of course, the United States coming up as itself an empire. But more important, and let me just quickly say something that we need to really remember that the United States occupied Haiti from 1915 to 1934. And that was a brutal occupation. And from that occupation, the United States imposed a, 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 a kind of system where it chose, it elected those who will govern the country. And those who will govern the country will do so on behalf of the United States. And the, all the governments there and even thereafter. And then we have to also remember in 1917, the Russian Revolution imposing a new economic system and the Second World War and also, of course, the Cold War. The Cold War is extremely important to understand what has happened and what's happening, not only in Haiti, but in the Western Hemisphere. Because the United States wanted to impose its hegemony in the entire Western Hemisphere, that it is from, from sea to shining sea, from Atlantic to the Pacific, including places like um, 
for the Philippines and Guam and places like that, the United States run. So in a sense, it's not so much that we are jumping on the United States. That's not the point. It's to understand the, the logic of economic structures, the logic of political and geopolitical strategies. The United States impose a system on all of these countries that are on and destabilize their economy and destabilize their governments to a great extent. We have to own up to that. Now, that does not mean that we are absolving Haitians of responsibilities. Of course not. But that, but that would be another issue. And then the pressing issue right now is not to suggest that we are excusing what's going on either, because the pressing issue is to that the Haitians who are in the border should be treated humanely, should be treated uh, uh, as human beings and with dignity and so on. So we should not forget that. So I'm not saying that and then forgetting what's happening. I'm just creating a kind of a context, a historical context to know that it is not accidental. It's not something that is a, the word escaped me right now for the moment, tout d'un coup. <laughs> it's not something that happens. Uh, how, do you, how would you say that, uh, Christina? Uh, Overnight. <laughs> It's not a sudden, yeah, <laughs> sudden thing. It's not like suddenly that the Haitians just appear in the border of the United States or suddenly they appeared as boat people. There, is a, there are historical precedents that make it so that their country cannot provide for them that which they believe that this country can provide for them. And the, one of the reasons why their country cannot provide for them what they believe this country can provide is because this country has systematically destabilized it, not e economically, politically, and otherwise. And, 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 and uh, one may want to debate that. Uh, I'm not sure that they will get, go that far because the evidence is overwhelming on the side of this particular hypothesis, if not in this particular th uh, thesis. If you yes, I mean, you've laid it out very clear. I, I would be curious as to who would want to debate <laughs> the facts that you've just laid out. And there's a couple of things that really stand out, particularly when you talk about how the United States occupation of Haiti, the political uh, destabilization, the economic, and there's a parallel to what I, what also happens on the continent. So when we look at African countries and you see how uh, European, whether the UK, Belgium, France, how they have engaged in that same behavior of installing presidents or leadership that actually serves the interests of the colonizing entity rather than the people of that country. And they utilize the military to repress and to suppress and ensure that their interests are protected, not the interests of the people. And this is what happens uh, daily on the continent. And it's important that we understand that so that we don't think that, well, the, the people just can't seem, seem to get it together. They just can't get good leaders. They need to understand leadership. All of these tropes that have been used to categorize Africans and Haitians who are by lineage Africans, but really linking it to intentional political economic interests of colonizing entities that continues on to this day. And so I, I'm very appreciative of that context that you bring um, to the discussion because it's so important to understand the root of what we're talking about and what we're seeing today. And I think uh, to you, Christina, just you've been really hands-on in this work and just speaking on some of what uh, Professor Balango Bear has talked about with regard to the policies of the US uh, and what's been happening. Can you articulate what are some of those, some of the policies that you've been uh, involved in, advocacy efforts, and, and some of the more recent demands that have been set forth in light of what is what's happening? So I would just throw in an additional layer. Um, so to the impacts of the, the political and economic um, manipulation um, is that it compounds the environmental disaster, the climate crisis that we are facing. So being an island in the, the cone of, of uh, hurricanes and tropical storms um, by design, and, and then also lying between two active fault lines, um, when you do not have the, the economic and political resiliency, how are you going to in that respond to these these environmental um these environmental disasters which are only becoming more frequent due to climate change so that i mean i know that could be like a whole entire topic of itself it's so critical. Um, but just to, to reinforce the narrative that it is not it is not that haitians cannot govern themselves and and that, that there's a lack of leadership there's a layering upon layering of issue of crises um that 
no one would be able to manage at the same time, especially when you don't have all of the tools um, at your disposal because of um, economic and political global policies that are hindering um, the decisions that are available to you. So what, what um, I'd also like to bring home is that much of the United States immigration policy as it relates to detention and, detention and enforcement is born out of a response to Haitian migration. So before the 1980s, there was no detention of, of folks that were attempting to enter the United States. There was the creation of Guantanamo as a detention facility to respond to um, the mass migration of folks um, leaving Haiti in the late 90s, um, and well, sorry, the late 80s, early 90s. And so when we look at the anti-Blackness that is baked into our immigration policies that disproportionately lead to the immigration the, the immigration detention or really incarceration of Black migrants and um, the, the disparate adjudication of humanitarian uh, humanitarian relief like asylum, um, it is because unfortunately the, the economic and political disasters that are created in our home countries by the United States are the same reasons why they decide to refuse, um, to refuse our um, appeals for um, quote unquote legal migration, right? And so when you, when you look at how the United States is, has treated the 15 plus thousand folks that, that have, um, that were under that bridge, um, images that will be bor burned into our psyche forever. We can never unsee those images. That is just the most recent manifestation of the, the anti-Blackness in our immigration system that decides that, you know, the, and really just, the structural racism that has been etched into our foreign policy is not enough of a reason for you to be able to be granted the privilege of being in the United States. And so when we look at why people are, um, are, are, are making these decisions to quote unquote, come for a better life, um, we have to see that there are very few options available to them. So there is a backlog for family-based petitions um, that spans upwards of 20 years. So, and, and the US embassy has been closed in Haiti for three years before, before COVID. So you have folks that have waited five plus years because their spouse or their sibling or their child petitioned for a green card for them all of that being approved, they waited in line, as we are told to wait in line, and they cannot pick up their green card from the U.S. Embassy because their doors are closed because of the security situation that they helped create in Port-au-Prince. So um, when you think, why are people under that bridge or why are people going through 10 countries? You have to think that, um, you know, unfortunately, unlike unlike on the continent, we do not have a robust refugee um, infrastructure run by the United Nations or the International Office of Migration. So who folks who would normally under any other circumstance be recognized as refugees are forced to only declare asylum. And you can only declare asylum on US soil. So you are saying that I have to, I have to receive legal protection by making a journey, whether it's by land, by sea, um, or by, by foot or by plane um, to make it to U U.S. soil to then make my claim for credible fear to then be granted to begin the process to be granted asylum. So we have to look at the policies and practices of our immigration system and overlay them with our longstanding foreign policy to understand how we actually we, because I am a, I am a U.S. born citizen, although I am of Haitian descent, um, and I like to say that I'm Haitian all the time. But anyway, I will claim this. I will take ownership of this because the United States government is acting on our behalf. They are making decisions in our name um, that destabilize countries <laughs> and then cannot actually, and then on the flip side, have policies which... Um, disincentivize folks to be able to come here and seek refuge, which is a human right. 
I really appreciate that context that you bring um, to this conversation and just wanted for the benefit of, of the folks who will uh, watch this program, can you just name some of the organizations that, that you know that are in your orbit that are engaged in advocacy work, direct service work with Haitian and other uh, Black migrants? Yes. So, and I know that you did ask me what policy demands there are. So I will quickly say that there are things that this administration could be doing right now. Um, so they could be ending the use of Title 42. So basically a, a public health, taking advantage of a public health crisis to deny people their right to due process to make a credible fear interview for asylum. So instead of getting to the border, declaring that you'd like to seek asylum, and then beginning the process, normally a two-year process to be able to receive asylum, you are immediately put on a plane and sent to Haiti, regardless of if it's been 10 years, two years, a month um, since you've been there, without any process, without any, um, without any process. So, um, Organizations like the Haitian Bridge Alliance, um, as well as Baji and Undocu Black, the Black Collective, um, and an entire constellation of organizations have actually circulated a sign on a petition to the Biden administration, specifically to President Biden, Vice President um, Harris, as well as Secretary um, Mayorkas to say that there, there are things that they can do without congressional action right now. Um, and that really the, the responsibility lies with them in terms of the practices that are, that are taking place on the border. And it's not just about um, you know, the use of the whip on black bodies, it's about the structural, um, you know, the structural racism that is that is baked into the system. And, and when we talk about immigration reform, um, that also means addressing anti-Black racism. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. And again, we'll drop some links in the chat for folks, along with the donation link to Haitian Bridge Alliance. People can donate to them right now and the documentary link so that we can share it. Please share it on your uh, social media and your networks via email. It is a powerful documentary. Jimmy, I know we have only a few minutes left, but I wanted to just turn back to you for uh, some final remarks as we reflect on this documentary that you produced in your ongoing work. And just to, to get a sense from you to share with us what, what this work looks like moving forward for you in your role as ambassador at large, as an actor, as someone who is uh, prominent in this space. Uh, well, uh, for me, you know, as um, as an artist, I'll always try to put as much effort as possible uh, to, to 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 put light on on Haiti, whether it is via a movie, via a documentary, or via a few interviews, because uh, I fully understand the Haitian cause. You know, uh, of course, not just born in Haiti, but uh, throughout my entire life experience you know i've always had to to carry haiti you know with uh, with pride uh, very close to my heart uh, whether it was uh, for the for the good or bad reasons you know so so i'm deeply rooted uh, with uh, with the haitian cause and uh, and and that is just because i'm simply after uh, a level of respect that i think that uh, Haitians in general are not getting. Uh, I believe that uh, that Haiti has been suppressed. You know, uh, we probably understand the reasons why, but um, just to say that I will continue to to do as much as I can to to fight for the country, to fight for my people, to fight for the Haitian. Uh, until we get the only ball of respect that I believe is equal to all. Very much appreciated for the work that you do and, and to know that it, it resonates, uh, that there are people that I've had conversations with in Senegal that are familiar with your work uh, and that are fans. And so this is part of our, our work in connecting the diaspora to each other and seeing each other and standing in solidarity with, with each other, uh, which is what this is about. So very, very much appreciated. And again, we're gonna be sharing the documentary. This is something that we need to be sharing in our networks as much as possible to shine light on, on this issue and adding the appropriate historical context uh, and facts 
as Professor uh, Balango Bear has shared with us. And so I want to just turn to you for just some final remarks from your perspective as a scholar uh, and, and what you see as the next steps or where we go from here. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank you for making this possible and for introducing me to two uh, e e e e ex e extremely interesting uh, and, uh, compatriots. And um, well, um, I, I think what I try to do personally is to put uh, uh, some context in what's happening. Uh, ironically, although Haitians are leaving the country in droves, Haitians are not, not asking for a handout. They're asking for a door to be open because once they are here, they actually take matters into their own hands and contribute greatly to the economy, to the culture, and otherwise in the country. And then they become great citizens. A lot of Haitians are participating in American uh, 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 the military forces, have gone abroad, and so on. So the Haitians are not asking for a handout, which is kind of, kind of ironic, because on the one hand, they are fleeing their country. But I think what I try to do is to explain the conditions that led the people to flee their country, and to show the global context in which it's occurring. Right now in the border, there are people leaving. So, it's global migration of workers. Uh, in, in the Congolese also leaving from the same itinerary from uh, from um, from Brazil to Argentina to other places to come to this country. Except that Canada has opened its doors to that. Whereas the United States, the beacon of of, of, of democracy and and so on and all these glowing words, uh, are now we are now seeing that uh, we hope it's not it wasn't a bluff. It wasn't, they weren't bluffing because, uh, but we have to also go back to realize that from, from Haiti's inception, there was what is called a cordon sanitaire that was uh, around Haiti. There was a, 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 they refused to recognize Haitian independence. In 18, in 1798, there was the US Congress passed the Alien and Sedition Act supposedly against France, but it was really to stop Haitians or uh, the newly uh, independent of going to be independent Haitians to leave after revolution of 1791. So if we, we have to, we have precedents, we have concrete uh, legal precedents to show how the United States have forever tried to keep the black bodies away. And you had, of course, the AIDS crisis. So there has always been a kind of medical or medicalization of the way in which they're, they're cordoned out the black bodies. So the fear of bringing diseases, the fear of infection. The, in fact, let me stop at this one. Jefferson referred to the Haitians as the freedom loving blacks and also said that it was an infection. Freedom was an infection that they didn't want to infect the African-Americans, Africans here in slavery with the disease of wanting to be free. And one of the most prominent doctors in the United States, uh, Benjamin Rush, created the, this disease called dreptomania. In other words, when the slaves would drop their, 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 their implements of, of, of work to run away, it was a disease. So running away from free to freedom, freedom was a disease. This is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, category uh, that you see. So uh, that's what we have to, I try to remind people that this is not only, yesterday, uh, only today, or yesterday, it is a long, long, long time. And it's tied to the greatest and most horrendous human trafficking in world history. That is what is euphemistically called the slave trade, which was a human trafficking for labor. So we have to recognize that. We have to remember that if yeah. we are the kind of country that we want to be. Yes, and I appreciate your candor and, and just, telling it like it is, it is so important that we don't euphemize uh, what happened, both past and present. And so your, your context and your depth of knowledge is greatly appreciated. And I also want to lift up uh, that there are other uh, Black migrants from other countries, as you pointed out. We have Congo, we have Cameroon. Uh, so many Cameroonians are making that journey. You have folks from Nigeria that are making that journey. So wherever you can find destabilization in these sort of patterns, it, it contributes to the outflow of people. And so um, while Haitians are in the majority, there are others that are caught up in that, uh, in that number as well, which is a, a key point. 
Um, and so I want to turn turn last but certainly not least to you, uh, Christina, for just your final thoughts as we see this playing out. And but also as we see a level of attention that probably is unprecedented in terms of people paying attention to what is happening and wanting to get involved. So I wanted to turn over to you for some final thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for creating this forum and for the documentary, Jimmy. This is this has been um, a little bit of soul food for me. I feel like sometimes I've been screaming into the void that, hey, this is happening, this is happening. Um, and, and folks really not paying attention. And so unfortunately it took those visuals to shake us all, um, but it's really up to us to now um, take our reaction and put it into action. And whether um, that is holding this administration um, and other stakeholders accountable, um, and th there are still decisions that are left to be made. So we do not know where the 12,000 people that were removed from underneath the bridge are. We don't know which detention centers, they're being basically denied um, interpretation services, um, as well as legal representation. And so I know that um, Catholic Legal Services, the Americans for Immigrant Justice, and a bunch of other folks, um, in addition to the Haitian Bridge Alliance, um, are really calling for, a, for transparency, um, as well as accountability. Because we do, um, we do actually have laws in place that the United States is responsible for, not only US laws, but also international laws that they're responsible for following. Um, and last but not least, um, we cannot forget that folks who are fortunate enough to get paroled in are, are appearing in South Florida, in Boston, um, in New York, <coughs> excuse me, um, and in the Carolinas. And, and so we also need to um, be able to, to continue our tradition of mutual aid and be able to receive folks um, who have just made it through such traumatic um, and harsh conditions so that they can um, become the, 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 the contributors that we know that they are. So with that, I just wanna thank you for creating this space. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone for joining us. And just, we're so grateful for the work that you're doing. Uh, in 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 policy advocacy, in education, uh, and in informing us in the arts, it really shows that it takes all of us and all of the gifts and talents that we have to really do this work. And I think for our our mission is really, especially as Diaspora Rising, is to show that we are connected. So there is. I mean, we can trace direct lineage to the Igbo people, to Haitians, of which I'm Igbo, and so when one of us is going through it, we have to start seeing ourselves in our people, no matter where we are geographically. And we are in a time with technology where it is easier now than it has ever been for us to connect. And so we wanted to have this conversation where we're bringing uh, our family together as part of the global black diaspora to really share our stories, our narratives for the purposes in part building relationships but also building some strategies. We know we, know we have a common uh, enemy, so to speak. And we also know that we have some very powerful uh, tools and, and people and energy that when we harness it collectively, there is nothing that can stop us from living and creating the kind of life and the kind of world that we deserve. And that is our ultimate goal. So with that, I wanna thank the three of you, Jimmy Jean-Louis, uh, Christina Francois, Professor William Balan Gobert, for this incredible, incredible conversation. We'll be sharing it with everyone who registered. Uh, we'll also be sharing the link to the documentary and asking you to amplify this in your networks and to continue to have this conversation because it doesn't end once the headlines stop. We've got to keep going. So with that, thank you all for your time and for sharing uh, your br brilliance with us. Thank you very much for making it happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.